Amen. Well, if you will stand with me now and turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 16. I'll read the last part and chapter 5 together next week. You'll see why that kind of goes together, the two lines. But here you have something where God is dissecting something that could be even in us. So be reminded as you turn there that this is God's holy word. Every single word is inspired by the Holy Spirit, inerrant, the only final authority in all that we are to believe and do. So hear the word of the Lord, starting in Genesis 4.1. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry. And his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain lest any who found him should attack him. And Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that you would cause it to make its mark upon our hearts by the Holy Spirit, to bring conviction to us where there is sin, and to bring a challenge and a love for your law that now by the Spirit we may do it and honor Christ. Show us here what is of your law and what is of the grace of Christ. Make that division, that separation even in our own hearts, in our own homes, in our own land. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The title of the message today is Bad Blood Over False Worship. Now, this is the first of many. And when I say that, that doesn't necessarily mean the first chronologically in terms of the story. There's ancient stories like the Epic of Gilgamesh. There's ancient laws, like the Code of Hammurabi and so forth. And, but as far as the first in chronological order, that's what we're talking about here, the first of many of what will be stories of blood feuds between brother and brother. Most famous, perhaps, in antiquity was the Roman myth of Romulus killing his brother Remus. And that is something that Augustine picked up on and actually compared that to this murder to show that Rome was a city founded on bloodshed. That might be a surprise to Roman Catholics, calling it the eternal city as they do, but it was founded on bloodshed. And he drew this connection, that that was a faint echo of this first true murder. 
Our Hollywood movies are filled with stories such as this, these petty rivalries between blood relatives. But real history is littered with such thing as well, brother wars, civil wars we call them, people willing to go against that old adage that blood is thicker than water. But what if I told you that underneath this, and you see this in Ephesians 2 also, the greatest feud of all in history that God himself started between Jew and Gentile, that their hostility against each other was ultimately a result of a wall of separation that God himself had put up, that it was a wall between the sinner and a holy God, and that that is what distinguished Israel and then made the Gentiles jealous of them. So what I want to show you today is that all this bad blood always goes together. In fact, I'm going to argue it comes from bad worship. Something broken between human beings and their maker. And and when I say that, I don't mean something about worship style, the worship wars, some of the things that we might think as evangelical churchgoers. I mean something that God himself must have made very clear all the way back from the beginning of the Bible. And so as we come to our text today in Genesis 4, let's recall where we've been. Adam and Eve are now removed from the Garden of Eden. Sin is in the world. The curse is in effect. And in this text today, we have bad worship issuing forth into bad blood between the first two brothers. And we'll see that that blood was already boiling long before it ever came to the surface. We'll see it in four ways. Number one, we'll see bad blood presumes God's blessing. Secondly, bad blood despises God's worship. Thirdly, bad blood murders God's image. And fourth, bad blood experiences God's exile. The passage ends, not surprisingly, in words that sound a lot like the last passage ended in Genesis 3. A lot of the the details about the curse are things that God moves Cain further into. But here's the big idea. Here's the doctrine that we're going to get the truth of this text today, it's this. Since bad blood follows false worship, we must seek a true worship from a better blood. So that's what we're going to see today, and first we'll see it in bad blood presuming God's blessing. Look first at Eve's reaction. Verse 1, now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. I I mentioned this in passing about chapter 3, these three hints of God's grace. I said, well, there's another in chapter 4. And this is one too. So simultaneously, Eve is going to do something bad here, but, but there is something good. She believes the promise. She too, not just Adam, believed in the promise. And you can see it in her words here. Cain's the new hope. Remember the promise of 315. There would be a seed. There would be an offspring. The offspring of the woman. Well, here he is. That's the most natural reading of the text. That's what you would have naturally thought if you were her. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's good. But notice how she expresses the joy in the midst of the fall. I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Might seem speculative, but commentators note some hint of presumption here. Sort of like the doctrine, God helps those who help themselves. Um, But you can start to see it in the names. Cain's name means acquire or gotten, whereas Abel's name means vapor or breath. And that signals to us the reading, Abel's name does, of the shortness of life, the quickness of it. Did that mean that to Eve? Is that what she was aiming for? Well, we don't know. It doesn't comment on her psychological state or her rationale for why she gave the names or Adam and her gave the names that they did. It's possible Abel was only an afterthought given what she was expecting of Cain. Maybe in despair over the fall, maybe she put a lot of thought into it. We don't know. But commentators look at this presumption. And it's not the only presumption. We as readers, we might have the presumption ourselves. We might get the idea that this is the way that God always does things. He passes on the covenant blessing through family ties, through firstborn sons, There's even a main work of covenant theology that was written that is really the main work that I always point people to, a guy named O. Palmer Robertson. It's called The Christ of the Covenants. And one of the the principles that he points to in covenant theology that runs from cover to cover in Scripture, and it's absolutely true, he calls it the genealogical principle. 
In other words, God works through families and seeds, and you see that reflected in the Old Testament idea of the firstborn getting the inheritance. God's for this. God ordained it. And so we see, okay, that's the whole show. That's how God does things. Not so fast. That's not all that's true. God has us in the Bible believe more than that. If you read, if you go on in Genesis and beyond, you'll see that the same God who passes on the blessing through bloodlines, through firstborns, He also has a knack Himself for upsetting that natural birth order. And it becomes central to the gospel story. We see it with Isaac over Ishmael. We see it with Jacob over Esau. We see it with Judah over his three brothers. And by the way, it wasn't because any of those were inherently righteous. Judas, Judah sinned big. Uh, we also see it with David, if you remember, over his older brothers. All of them are older. His better-looking brothers, his strong brothers. That's the way the Bible painted them. So you would expect, just as the father, Jesse did, well, what about this one? What about this one? But here's Samuel's response. The Lord said to Samuel, this is 1 Samuel 16, 7, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. So he did the same to Saul, by the way. He's coming to anoint a new king. I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees, but the Lord looks on the heart. So we look to the surface of natural bloodlines. It's built into the promise. It's built into the story from left to right in Scripture, so we stay on the surface. But remember, another category we should have from Genesis 3 is that this bloodline is now a cursed bloodline. Everyone, everyone in Adam is now, has bad blood. Cursed. And so we should look past the surface, underneath to the nature of the promise. Moses, quickly, as he's inspired by the Spirit writing Genesis, he moves the story forward. He moves from verse 1 to verse 2, and he, sa- he doesn't tell us anything about their childhood. They're, they're not going to get in a fight over their Legos or anything like that. They might, but uh, that's, not, he, that's not what he says. He goes right to this moment, and hold on to that. I'm bringing that up for a reason. There are particular weird skeptical objections, famous ones, that people bring up about Cain, and you'll want to remember this as far as the, the duh And it will be a duh response that we give to them. Something very simple that they've overlooked. He fast forwards. Verse 2, Abel was a keeper of the sheep, Cain a worker of the ground, but just with their Legos. No, no, no. They were adults. They could have been in their 40s, 50s. We don't know. But let's just say they were in their 20s. Hold that thought. Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Cain was a worker of the ground. You may remember that David was a shepherd too. I brought him up. And he was despised by his brothers. This story doesn't give us many details about their brotherly rivalry, like what all led up to this. But it's clear enough that this offering in this story was the last straw. Something that characterized their whole lives came between them. Something had been bubbling up. And this bad blood very often goes all the way back to our most natural presumption that we all have. But presumption doesn't just lead to wrong answers on tests. It's not just about trivial matters. When we're talking about God promising you life when you're dead, to presume upon your own nature, to presume upon your own doings, is not going to end well in the rest of life. Nothing is more presumptuous in all the world than a sinner in relation to God. There is no blood that boils more deeply. As Paul said in Romans 1.30 at the end of that chapter where he reads off this rap sheet of all the evil of mankind. He calls all sinners in verse 30, haters of God. You've got to interpret Scripture in light of Scripture. Before you get to the altar here with Cain and Abel, you've got to remember, oh, that's right. The Bible's interpretation of Genesis 3 is that everybody that comes out of that garden, at heart, is a hater of God. And yet we expect good things from God by nature. Of course God's going to bless us. Because what? Is that, is that your first assumption when you come into this world? That's our first problem. Secondly, bad blood despises God's worship. Before we get to the murder, the ultimate in relationships going wrong, so we think, at the center of this passage is actually worship having gone wrong. There has never been a time or a place on planet Earth where the specifics of worship didn't matter. 
I know if we've spent time in the evangelical church, and specifically if we're going to churches that go out of their way to make it look like a storefront or a gymnasium, and there's nothing wrong with meeting in those places, that's not the point. But we try to unchurch church. We try to smooth it over because we remember in the Bible, didn't Jesus say that, uh, you know, you worship on that mountain, we worship on this mountain. And said, no, God worship, He wants us to worship Him in spirit and truth. In other words, the specifics don't matter. Is that how you read that passage? Because that's not what Jesus says. In fact, He says the opposite. Right worship doesn't go away. The specifics of the old covenant priesthood and tabernacle and so forth, that goes away. That's fulfilled in Christ. But does that mean that anything goes? Is, is that the way we read it? Notice how this story speaks to that. Notice that this is long before the moral law is unpacked at Mount Sinai. This is not the tabernacle worship of Israel. In other words, we can't say about right worship in the Bible that specifics were only for the Old Testament Jews. Not so. This is way before the law of Moses. This is for all mankind. This is over all this bad blood. God is specifically declaring bad worship. Something Cain did, Cain knew not to do. But how so? What was so bad about this worship? Well, some people, here's one theory, they think it's about the blood. I've been talking about the blood. I said it's bad blood. Yeah, that must be your view. What they mean, though, is something different than what I mean, because I, it, is, it was in the blood. But what those people in this theory mean by this, and by the way, it's a very understandable, reasonable theory, taking the whole Bible into account. The idea is that God accepted Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's sacrifice because Abel's was the sacrifice of an animal. He brought blood, and that represents the sacrifice of Jesus. And Matt, aren't you saying all the time that all these things are a type and a shadow of what Jesus would do? Yes, yes. So Cain's sacrifice then was less like the gospel. There you have it. But there's three reasons to reject that view. First, the New Testament verses, and there's quite a few of them, that refer to this incident never go there. Secondly, there were other offerings in the Old Covenant worship system other than bloody sacrifices of animals. And in fact, the same Hebrew word that is used here for Cain's offering is used for the grain offering that God Himself ordained in the Law of Moses. So that can't be the problem. And then a third reason can be gleaned directly from this text, although it is more subtle. But let's look at verses 3 and 4. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. I read that fast. Let me go slower. And Abel also brought of the firstborn, does that help, of his flock and of their fat portions. Now, do a little study in the law of Moses, fat portions there. Those are, those are actually, it speaks of abundance. And that's something even that the, uh, that the priests oftentimes would share with the people. Something's overflowing. Something is abundant. Something is Abel's best. The suggestion is that unlike Abel, Cain, the firstborn, who you'd think is the firstborn should have known this, doesn't give his first fruits. What fruit it is, an animal versus fruit, matters less. Just ask the woman who gave all that she had, and Jesus said she gave more than the person that was rich who gave what looked like a lot. And one commentator calls this problem tokenism. Uh, not Tolkien. <laughs> Token. Uh, tokenism. Just In other words, leftovers. Leftovers. Like another firstborn later on named Esau, Cain had come to despise the promises of God. So this bad blood wasn't over the good blood in Abel's sacrifice. There wasn't any. Abel, in his intrinsic self and his sacrifice, could offer nothing to God. He was a sinner just as much as Cain. And the author of Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 10.4, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So the, he's not pointing to Abel's sacrifice and saying, whoa, that impressed a holy God. No. God's pleasure in Abel was not Cain's problem. Abel's sacrifice wasn't Cain's problem. Cain's physical things were not even Cain's problem. Something boiling in Cain's heart already. 
was the problem. And you can zoom in even closer in the manner in which Cain killed, in verse 8, it's, it's positioned in this context as being in the same manner. Kind of like he was the firstborn, he was supposed to bring his firstborn. You have an evil irony here. Abel was made a sacrifice. In a sense, Cain would be saying to God, oh, you don't like my sacrifice? I'll give you some blood. Now, that's speculative, perhaps, as the commentators look at that in the Hebrew and all of that stuff. But that's really what he's doing. Just as surely as wicked priest Caiaphas in John 11 unwittingly made his plot against Jesus a prophecy of Christ's work. Caiaphas didn't mean to do that. God did that. And so the same words where he was conspiring to kill Jesus became a prophecy of the nature of Jesus' work on behalf of the whole people. So in the same way, Cain unwittingly made his brother a type of Christ's work, even though all he meant to do was murder his brother. But through that, as we'll see thirdly, he was pointing the dagger at God because bad blood murders God's image. Here's one of the New Testament verses I was talking about, 1 John 3, 2. We want to read the New Testament verses and say, well, what do they say about what this was all about? It says in 1 John 3, 12, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. So you say, okay, that doesn't help me under the microscope of the bad blood, but it does tell me that the cause was before the actual rock or whatever to strike Abel with. Something was brewing. That's the New Testament magnifying glass on history's first murder. Jealousy. Because Abel's sacrifice was this, mine isn't. But jealousy over what? Nothing that Abel had in himself, as I just said, is something that Cain could not have had himself with God. But God had a direct, immediate, high-powered looking glass into Cain's heart and on the spot in Genesis 4. So before we ever get to those New Testament texts, look at God Himself doing surgery spiritually on Cain, because in so doing, the Holy Spirit is doing a surgery on our hearts. In the act, on the eve of destruction, in the spiritual cells of the bad blood as it's rushing toward its target of rage, God knows that Cain is lurching toward Abel on the eve of that. And does God sit back passively as the sight of the creature rushing headlong in that way? Does God just sit back and do nothing? No. Verses 6 and 7 give us God's searching, magnifying glass of conviction. And we already looked forward to these verses when we were in Genesis 3, 16. Well, now let's look back. Verses 6 and 7. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Sin is personified here. This is interesting, the way the Bible talks here. It's metaphorical. It's not that the sin becomes a person, although in a sense, under the influence of sin, it does become us. It's animated as crouching here. Think of a a tiger stalking its prey. That's sin. That's Cain inside Cain. It's not the devil made me do it. It's increasingly Cain. But then there's this intelligent design aspect. It has a desire. That makes this a great enemy within. Peter says in 1 Peter 2.11 that sin wages war against your soul. You, now, Christian, even born of the Spirit, yet you still have this indwelling sin. It is crouching. It is waging war against your soul. So what's the connection here between that worship, that envy, and then this bubbling over point? If this bad-blooded enemy of sin is inside of us, well, then it's inside Abel, too. And yet we read in Matthew 23, 35 about the blood of righteous Abel. We're going to run into the same thing that we have to think through when we get to Noah. He was righteous. He's righteous. What happened first? Well, we've got answers there. But even of Abel, it would take a massive study to make the case that bad worship boils the blood that's already bad. 
that Abel, the Bible's not claiming that Abel was not a sinner. That's not the point here. That should already be clear. But do I really mean to say, making that connection between worship and what becomes murder, do I really mean to say that the consequences of falling away from the true worship of God are so bad that they lead us to murder the image of God. I think one evidence to that, I would suggest throughout history, is to look at history and try to find me an example otherwise of a place that used to be Christian, that turned their back on Christ, and just let's just do this statistically, that the murder rates don't go up, that all manner of hell breaks loose, issuing forth ultimately into murder, mass murder, genocide, Really? Well, now I'll give you a theological explanation. This is a statement in John's letter. It's 1 John 4.20. And he's talking to Christians, and he's calling us on our hypocrisy. If we claim to be Christians, that should create love. And here's how he said it. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For, so he's saying, because, I'll give you the reason, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. So you say you love God, but wouldn't you think it'd be easier to love the guy right in front of you that you do business with every day? But you don't. And I know you don't, because you, that should be easier. It's easier for other reasons too. The conditions to love them, you would think, would be less. So in John's rationale though, our hatred of neighbor is not the cause of us hating God. No, it's just the opposite. And this is the evidence of it. Our hating other people evidences our hating of God. In the same way as we love because He first loved us, and that's in the verse right before it, so we hate down here because we first hated Him. This is what Jesus says. When he's building the expectation his disciples are to have in John 15, 18 about persecution, he says what? If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. You're just symptom level. They hate you to the degree that you remind me. Uh, Why is there a bloodlust to sacrifice babies in the womb? There's lots of reasons, but fundamentally it's because they are the image of God and they are relatively speaking, from the human being's perspective, the most innocent, they remind them of God. And that's why they sacrifice them to their false god, Molech. Now, there's other reasons within that. But Jesus is saying, the more you resemble me as a Christian, the more they're going to hate you. What does that mean? That means that the ultimate hate is a hatred of me, it's what he's saying. That's the connection. It's this, if we lose sight of God, we lose sight of the image of God. If our hearts grow cold toward God, our hearts grow cold to the image of God. If we would think nothing of stealing glory from God, well then, we're not going to think anything of mistreating our fellow men. You see the same connection in the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee. How does it start in Luke's narration in verse 9 of Luke 18? That he told this parable to those who justified themselves before God and And he adds, and mistreated other people. I'm like, what's the connection? Well, the Pharisee's beating his chest and saying, thank you, God, for me, because I'm so wonderful. Aren't you glad to have me on the team? That's pretty much what it means. I tithe twice a day. I do all these things. Not like this, this bum back here, this tax collector. What's the connection? If you're going to exalt yourself before God, if you think you're hot stuff before God, what's that good? What does that tell me about how you're going to treat other people? You're going to think nothing of other people if you exalt yourself before God. Cain's premeditation is evident here since the presence of the Lord returns to ask the question. And then Cain's impertinent response is all we need to see the depths that his heart had sunk. Pure hatred against both God and man. The two are inseparable. Another link can be seen when you look at the form of the Ten Commandments in those places in the New Testament that draw attention to this. And one of the most famous places is when the lawyer asked Jesus about the greatest commandment. How does Jesus respond in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That is the first, and, sorry, the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Have you ever just paused and 
and, and instead of just seeing the two things that he said and, and saying, well, he asked for one greatest commandment, he gives him two, and that's all true and that's all interesting and you can go places with that, but ever you just stopped on that one detail, a second is like it. Love fellow man is like loving God. Have you ever just looked at the Ten Commandments and wondered why the Reformed tradition talks about two tables of the law? The first four being your Godward love. The last six, commandments five through ten, being your treatment of fellow man. When Jesus says the second is like it, what he means is that loving the image of God, just like the image of God is a copy, is a replica, show me how you treat fellow man and you'll be showing me everything I need to know about how you love God. The second is like it. What we do in relation to the image of God says something about the essence of God. And if we don't do this finally, that bad blood spills over into exile. There are consequences for not loving God. We see that it spills forth into our mistreatment of fellow man, and then then it really gets bad. You say, what do you mean it really gets bad? Adam and all of his descendants, apart from Christ, are going to go to hell. It can't get worse than that. That's true, but we've also seen that God has a stay of execution, that in this life, it actually can get worse by degrees. There are further and further exiles to the east, and that's part of what's being dramatized by Cain being driven further. You say, you're already driven out of Eden. Where's the have love to get? It gets worse. It can, get, it can always get worse. On your way to hell, here and now, it can get worse. Cain is cut off from his work, his home, his God. You notice that refrain where God says it to him and then Cain echoes back, well, this will, then I'll be, and then he just repeats God's word. I'll be a fugitive. I'll be, I'll be cut off from the ground and so forth. He's alienated from God and therefore he's alienated even from himself, his work, his family, and so forth. Just like his parents, Adam and Eve, when they disobeyed God, they were punished by being cut off from their work, their home, and their God. And just as Adam and Eve didn't die physically on that day, so Cain lived on in this life. The Scripture says in Ezekiel 18.4 that the soul that sins shall die. And yet, he goes on in this life, cut off from the life of God. There's time to repent. Haven't you noticed that you were not utterly destroyed by God after sinning yesterday? Or after every single time we sin? Each time we sinned, He would have been right to condemn us. And yet, as the book of Lamentations says, His mercies are new every morning. His mercies, as far as even the non-elect are concerned, they're breathing in His mercy and therefore adding to their judgment. But even that breath is mercy, either mercy abused or mercy taken advantage of. Cain is punished by exile. Nod here means wandering. So he is to the east, but specifically he is now called a wanderer. But even with that, it is a merciful exile. That's the way he should have treated it. God even ensures a measure of safety, this mark. No, this mark is not talking about racial distinctions or those kind of conspiracy theories. You don't need it. Adam's race is already cursed. Now there's going to be a further division, but that division is not going to be different teams of bad. The division is going to come when Christ redeems out of Adam's bloodline By his own blood. What's Cain's focus, though? Is is his focus, I'll take this time to learn that. What, What would you have me learn in this situation? No. He says to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have, you, you've driven me away today, away from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. What a totally inappropriate pity party. And I think we do this to a certain extent, one way or another. And this from the man who asked if he was his brother's keeper. Now he's asking God, hey, can you give me a keeper or two? I'm going to be alone. How impertinent. This is not true repentance. And yet God still does not kill him right then and there. 
There is a kind and patient exile. Yes, a curse, but there is a chance to turn, perhaps one day. And so we should take note, as Paul says in his letter to the Romans in two places, in chapter 11, verse 22, he says, of the kindness and severity of God. We should take note. We should pay attention, he says, to the kindness and severity of God. Severity, he says, toward those who have fallen. But God's kindness to you, provided you continue in His kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. And he said already in chapter 2, verse 4 of that letter, God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. It's a way of saying, each sunrise, each time your parents, if your children, take you to church, each Bible collecting dust on your shelf, each Christian relative, though you may find them annoying in some ways, they are an angel from God, a messenger of grace, giving you an extra chance, another day to be reconciled to God. Now to that first, I mentioned there's a couple objections. I'll close with this and I'll go to the application. But I said there's a couple of objections that skeptics bring up about Cain. The more famous one we'll bring up next week. It goes better there. But here, here's the first one. Why would Cain be afraid that somebody would kill him? He says in verse 14, I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. Wait a minute. Who would be there to find him? Dun, 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 or a drum roll or some kind of, oh man, we're lazy. That's why I had you pause between verse 1 and verse 2, and I brought up my little Legos joke. How old are Cain and Abel by this point? I don't know, but they're at least in their 20s. It could be in their 40s or 50s, but let's just go lowest number. Let's lowball it at age 20, 21, 22. I don't want to make this about the birds and the bees, and I'm no mathematician, but I'm pretty sure they could have had a couple kids in that meantime. In other words, the skeptic, you're being lazy again. He's got siblings. Sibling rivalry was nothing between him and Abel, who would be even more out for vengeance than, I don't know, a, a brother. So, hold that in your hat. Uh, hint, you might have caught it. It'll be part of our answer to the more famous objection. Where'd Cain get his wife? <gasps> it's just, they're not even trying. Um, but we'll talk about that next week. But just as a hint, Cain and Abel are being depicted here as adults. That's why they have vocations and jobs. That's why they have property and stuff that they were to offer to God, because they're not kids. Okay, so let's just think. Yeah, that's what I would say to the skeptic. Now, let's uh, apply this to our lives as Christians. Um, I said at the beginning that uh, bad blood and false worship go together. And uh, what do we get out of that? Um, because if, if, in my big idea, I said, if we get out of that, that we must seek a true worship from a better blood. Sounds ringy, but what does that mean? What do you mean by that, Matt? Well, three things. First of all, this passage is an exhortation to us. Since bad blood despises God's worship, we should be, in a sense, like Abel. We're not to be like Cain. There's another half. We are to be like Abel. We should give God only our best. Abel did. Cain didn't. So the application there is clear. This is, this is more than a call to be on the right side of the worship wars. We're Presbyterian, and we do this right now. And then stop. Believe me, I, I have a reason for being Presbyterian. I can make the argument for being Presbyterian. Order. I could go there. Um, but that's not, let's take some pause here. All Christians, no matter what views you have of the particulars, the circumstances of worship, in the main, from our heart, it starts with our heart, with our best. Like Abel, we should worship the right way by faith. Listen again to the author of Hebrews, Hebrews 11.4. By faith... Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Notice it doesn't say, by fruits and vegetables, Abel offered to Cain a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. That's true, he did. That's what he had. That's, that's what he had. But by faith, he offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So Cain is not the only object lesson here. Abel's action still speaks, the Bible says. What was his action? Well, ultimately in that verse, it was faith. By faith, we bring God our best. 
We believe in God's promises to the point where we don't withhold anything from God. We don't withhold our best from God. What's the connection? When I withhold my best from God, what am I lacking? Faith. What? How, how, how does that work out? Well, if I, if, I, if I offer myself in this way, they might think such and such of me. If I offer my kid to God, my kid won't be safe. If I offer my money to God, who's going to pay the bills? That's what we're doing. In every single case, we lack faith in not giving our best to God. Whatever our best is, whatever our resource we're talking about, there's a lack of faith. We cling to our things. We cling to our ways of doing church because we don't trust God for the results. So hopefully we can see another connection now between God-pleasing faith and God-pleasing worship. Secondly, this passage is an admonition to us. It's a warning. Since bad blood murders God's image, we should guard our violent hearts. You say, I got a, I got a violent heart? Well, Jesus gives us this warning in the Sermon on the Mount. We, we did our call to confession with this verse from Matthew 5.22. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother... Raise your hand if you've ever been angry with your brother. I have. I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. And Jesus ends with that scenario, the situation in court where we who have had no mercy, we who have been at our neighbor's throat, we now find ourselves in prison with no mercy. Or Paul to the Galatians in chapter 5, but if you bite and devour one another, Watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Not coming to terms with God is a fire that quickly spreads to our attitude toward those around us. And so this passage is giving us a warning to nip that in the bud, to put that fire out, to be reconciled to God and to find peace through Christ. And that ends us out finally in this passage giving us gospel. Since bad blood wanders God's world in exile. I just said, I'm guilty of that very thing. Jesus said, you're liable to the hell of fire. That means I'm admitting that I do things all the time that are liable to the hell of fire. So I would be in exile. I've been in exile. We're in a world of exile. But we should use this time always to repent. For the Christian, we don't repent because we're getting back into grace. That repentance is something only a Christian can do. It's an evidence of grace, that grace has come before But like Abel, by that same faith that offers, we should look past even our own offering to Christ's offering. Because what was Abel's blood representing there? You see it in the author of Hebrews one chapter later, that when we come to Jesus, what are we coming to? We're coming to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. That means it speaks a better word than your best offering a better word even than the way that God makes your life point to Christ and glorify Him. Because when we do that, we'll do it with horrible motives. We'll make tons of mistakes. We'll only see later. But God guarantees, not on the basis of that, but on the basis of Christ's blood, of Christ's righteousness in our place, that that speaks to God Himself, that He accepts uh, Christ's sacrifice. So let me pray. Father, help us to come to Christ in that way, to see His blood and His righteousness as that which is now our record before You by faith alone. Help us as a response as we learn to repent more and more, as we turn from our sin, as we put out that fire in practical ways in our lives of lashing out against others, being ungrateful to You, that as you teach us the grace of putting that behind us, through it all, above it all, we would look to Christ to know that that is ultimately the ground of every single move we make, that we would be hopeless without His blood. But with His blood, we have a perfect hope. We thank you for it, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.